Could you, Irene? How you know how hard you? it was to find these films? Like it's like one of the few race films that she ever starred in. Really? Uh, do you mind if I smoke? No, go ahead. You know, what's so weird about this setup? What? I don't know, it just feels like, you know, a setup. Like, I don't know, you know, all this dinner and... And what? And friendly conversation. <laughs> well, I have to confess that I am a little... No, I'm very attracted to you. What? Um, I was just gonna say that you're really a cute woman. I know that. I heard what your friend said at the video store. You heard us? I found the hots for you since the minute I saw you shelving tapes. Can I have a cigarette? Sure, help yourself. Is the um, fire in there too? Uh, yeah, but it's a little lighter. <laughs> so, um... Now that we know that we're attracted to each other, what do we do? Um... Don't you think we should kiss? You're a no-good lying tramp, that's what you are. Committing a sin that will surely send you to hell. I am going to hell, but not for being a tramp, but for being poor and living on the streets like I've had to do. Why can't I be happy fitting into their world? God made me this color and he did it for a reason. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tara Brown. Welcome to this BFI at Home event. Um, tonight, I'm so excited and so pleased to be joined by Cheryl Jonier and Alexander Duhas to talk about the Watermelon Women as part of BFI's um, first on screen season, all about the female slash woman gaze in film. Um, so, yeah, we're all here together across the channels. Um, so let's just start. So, um, my, so I'm Tara Brown, I'm a film programmer, and my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Um, do you want to let me know your pronouns? I'm Cheryl uh, Dunye, and it's um, she, her. And I'm Alex Juhas, and I'm she, her, hers as well. Juhas, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, great. So, um, yeah, we're all here to talk about the Melody Woman, 24 years on from this super groundbreaking film. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of talk about what you do now, because you have made this amazing film, but there's also so much else that you get up to. I bet you can think about sort of the teaching, um, writing and working with other film festivals. Alex? Oh, Cheryl, you go first. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, about two, three years ago, um, I transitioned um, out of teaching. I was teaching a film at San Francisco State um, and moved into um, episodic television directing. I was tapped by Ava DuVernay to direct uh, a couple episodes of the show Queen Sugar and then I've been directing um, episodic TV full-time ever since and I live in Oakland, California. Wonderful. Um, Alexandra, yeah. At the time and still I make primarily work as a film scholar and media scholar and my um, writing and thinking is about activist media. Um, I also make activist media uh, and I've made and thought about activist media in a range of issues. I began thinking about AIDS activist video. Um, I have a book that I co-authored with Yvonne Welbin about black lesbian cinema. Uh, I work on YouTube and digital culture and um, the Watermelon Woman and the Owls, which I also helped Cheryl with, are the only narrative films I've ever worked on, but I think of them as activist media as well. Awesome. And then um, Alexandra, I think it might be interesting to sort of, you can expand on your role as producer for Watermelon Woman, because I think people always recognize Cheryl Dunley for her amazing work and a blending of styles, but producer also has a massive role to play when getting this piece of work um, up on screen, don't you think? Of course. Um, and again, I would give a shout out to the book Sisters in the Life, which is um, that I co-edited with Yvonne Welbin because there's an amazing piece in there about Candace Moore about the role of producers in black lesbian cinema. And she interviews me and a bunch of other producers. And um, so I go over there if you want to know about it uh, more, more people who do this. But because 
um, these films have been so under supported, although desired by their community, there's been very little money to make them and a lot of passion to yeah. see them made. And the Watermelon Woman certainly came from a place of no money, a lot of passion. It occurred with inside a close community of queer people, lesbians, people of color that were friends of Cheryl and I and our community. And um, sort of produ producing the infrastructure so that someone's vision like Cheryl's can happen is a group project of love and energy and producer helps mobilize that. But Cheryl also produced it. So mm. we did that together. And we had a co-producer for that movie called Barry Swimmer, who was one of the producers of Paris is Burning. Oh, wonderful. Great. Thank you so much. And then, um, you know, you two have had this sort of wonderful relationship for um, several years now. So were you friends before we made What Men the Women or was it kind of during that process? Yeah, we met in, um, I guess, in the early 90s. Was that right? Like 90, 92, maybe? Yeah. Somewhere around there. And then we became a couple in 90, immediate, so somewhere within early time after that. And then um, we made this during our couple dumb and we also had a couple kids and um, in the early mid early 2000s we um, divided our ended our relationship as uh, partners but we of course are connected through projects and kids yeah yeah Wonderful. and of course there's a there's a story Cheryl likes to tell but I'm happy to tell it now about how we basically traded I said I would produce the watermelon woman if she agreed to move to California with me for my first uh, job that I got there. And I knew nothing about producing films <laughs> and, you know, made it up as I went along. Uh, but it was worth it. Great. Great. Um, in the film, um, they got this you know, central relationship with sort of Shell and Diana. And there's a lot of um, friction and sort of um, conflict that kind of, that kind of brings up in the film, especially with Cheryl and her friends. Um, I was just kind of wondering how you think those um, perspectives on that kind of dating, you know, um, whether it's sort of, yeah, how that sort of dating idea is that sort of evolved since then? Do you think people think differently now? Or do you think it's all sort of the same issues coming up over and over? I think it's, you know, pretty much the same interracial, queer, dating, um, interracial dating in general, um, I think those, I mean, it's just who tells the story. I mean, rarely do you hear it from the person of color side, but, you know, sometimes you do. Um, but I think the same issues, uh, you know, people have, you know, within themselves about their community, uh, I, I think those are still relevant from the film. Um, and I think it definitely, you know, a lot of queer people are dealing with it but you know I, I i i think there's still just not an invisibility but um a shifting that's happening right now with with hearing from the other side of the rainbow as i would say mm. um about what what being in these situations are like definitely even in more media like uh literature too so you're, you're we're just starting to hear about it more yeah yeah definitely and um do you think what was it more about representation or is it more about sort of the statement or sort of decentering white voices to tell your own story or is it a mixture of both? I think it was more about spunk and chutzpah and doing it and being the first one and mm -hmm. getting my story told as an artist. Um, I think you know it's sort of by any means necessary that it had to come you know it's like birthing a baby you know so it's just like I had to do this uh creatively and it stitched together I think all of those things um as you make a piece of art you really don't know the outcome per se and you know what effect it will have you know your income what you're going in with um and knowing that you're tapping on things and when you gather a crew and people together you know that you know definitely people believe in it so that you're riding on a lot of energy and uh, possibility but never to my mind did I know that this film would have relevance and um, impact still at this mm. point I'm not thinking about that you're thinking uh, you know yeah, it's a more yeah. immediate um, impression that I wanted to to create um, and feel so to for this to be 
you know, sort of my oeuvre and big piece that I made or, you know, a major thing of my life, I'm uh, more joyful and surprised that I went ahead and did it. And, 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 and it also says about intuition um, as a queer person, as a, an artist, to live and have experiences so I can tell stories. Absolutely. Um, do you want to add into that, Alexandra? Well, I would just say back to the question about um, interracial dating, sex, desire, and community. That is one of the main issues of the Watermelon Woman. It was interesting for us when we um, did the 20 year remaster and we re released it that that was pretty taboo to talk about 20 now it's 24 years ago and it people still didn't want to talk about it yeah, when we yeah. took it on the road <laughs> and so they want to talk about everything else and that one just kind of was like yeah um mm. and Cheryl and I have actually thought about that since because it was so noticeable um but I, the other thing I would say and would be interested to Cheryl talk about this is that there's a lot of intra racial stuff that goes on with Cheryl and her black friends and Cheryl and you know other characters that she may or may not have desire for the character Cheryl and um, you know that people are more interested in thinking about um, and can see so you know like the funny scene at the beginning with yeah singing and Cheryl not being interested in dating her or Tamara's interest in Cheryl dating only black women and how the character has to work that through so I'd love to know what Cheryl thinks about that moving forward uh, can you, sorry, preface that again? I was taking, making notes and now I lost the original <laughs> question. Well, so. about, about intra-black dating, about the things that the, the film also raises about your desire or not desire for the black women around you and the um, I think, you know, people have not progressed that much about it, you know? I mean, I think there's, oh, I, I think it happens, there's not a discussion um if anything more um we're starting to see more of it in shows you know and out there in other media so i definitely feel like this new generation the generation of our kids who are 22 and 21 um, are basically experiencing our dreams you know and if we are on that queer rainbow they're they're having a queer rainbow life in the sense that they're they're they they're the days and thems and you know they're pushing those boundaries um uh they say that you know most uh kids in that age group in the U united states of america right now are queer um so you know we got what we asked for uh you know but the other kind of nature of living in a capitalist society that you know race was you know an integral part of how the labor and and how people how this country runs and and that machine that plays with that story hasn't changed so there's a lot of you know internalized racism there's a lot of you know looking at race from your own perspective and kind of you know still happening and that does trickle down to you know queer desire and yeah and uh, black on black dating as a queer and why that is better than dating outside of your race and this and that. I mean, it's still, uh, it's still there. There are more outlets to speak about it, but I don't think that the environment of the world changes. And I think people still internalize every battle the same way. Yeah, yeah. And like, why do you think people do find it difficult or could you actually talk about that interracial, interracial relationship? Like, you know, half the time it's a cover on the film itself. It's like one of the, the film's most, you know, indelible images, but people seem to, but you're saying people are kind of avoiding it. I, I, I'm kind of wondering what, what, what are they scared of? What are they scared of that they might find or scared to learn about themselves even? Um, it's a birth of a nation and everybody, you know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> you know, that, that's basically what it is. It's your own birth of a nation that you carry on yourself and that the world has put on you to see that we don't see that desire out there. It's not, you know, it's not part of the master narrative of any world to see your parents, even whoever they were, uh, you know, what, you know, whatever, how they identify having intimacy. Our culture does not, you know, value uh, conversations about sexuality in general. I mean, um, Western society doesn't. Um, it's, you know, something in the dark and, and something, you know, to, it always you know, unspoken uh, it, it, rules and sort of right. so for, for for to look to, at people. Yeah. Right. So for it to be integrated into a narrative in itself is already, you know, taboo. 
than to go and put it as something real and natural within context of uh, a lesbian desire in the 90s, you know, it's, it's a little cray. And, and that's why people definitely sort of were not talking about it. <laughs> I, I also think if you look at the way just that sex scene is set up, and I know you guys want to talk about the sex scene, the, and what Cheryl said about Birth of a Nation and the history of cinema, they're watching an early, the, the two characters, Tamara and Cheryl, no, not Tamara, Diana and Cheryl are watching a sex scene um, that, uh, I'm sorry, that. they're not watching a sex scene. <laughs> watching no, just a clip from a film. A clip from a film and the politics of racism and racist representation is so live in the room between the characters. And what's weird about that moment is that it, that live energy, that crackle, which is political, um, then shifts into the sex scene. But it's so deeply politicized in American culture. Right, it was, it was a culture. clip about passing. Um, and so yeah. the light, the light skin character it's um, white powder and yeah was putting, and she said enough with that white powder and there's a slap and that same violence translates to this violence uh that same interrogation or not addressing the interrogation addresses into it but that desire is still as hot you know it's still like the good slap you love <laughs> and it's not and it's not i mean what's complicated about that cut and then what happens between the two of them and the sex scene it's not just violence although histories of violence are certainly written around it there's many other emotions that are live when they're, cause you guys are so cute with the sharing of the cigarette beforehand. So there's all this like early love and, you know, Cheryl's character in particular is so naive. And um, so, you know, it's the opposite of violence too that you're per performing. And then it turns into, you know, the sex scene, which is very intimate and fun. Yeah, it was interesting because um, when I was rewatching it, it was interesting to see how Diana were sort of so sort of forward and sort of really moved forward and sort of you know Cheryl's character was kind of like I don't know I'm kind of going to go with this and it's, and it's all the looking um I think um one interesting thing about sort of lesbian bisexual women loving women desire is a lot of that is for sort of looking and the longing and the cool sort of thing like I felt really reminds of that in um portrait of Lady on Fire which you know I feel that does a lot in sort of looking at that gaze and it was interesting seeing it as well like in the queue for the fruit stall and Diana's friend sort of is all a bit stressed for whatever reason <laughs> and there's still those sort of looks and acts and forth I think and then I mean do you think that I, mean, I think it all applies a lot to sort of a woman gaze of desire do you do you agree with that or do you think it was something different. I, you know, the gaze, the gaze, the gaze. Um, <laughs> I think that's what you know. Uh, there's, there's, there's a, a sort of um, uh, pleasure we get out of looking, you know, uh, in general. Um, be it, you know, being a funus and walking through the city to, you know. Um, now where we're just online constantly, you know, on our devices looking at Instagram and getting some sort of pleasure. Um, uh, it's definitely important to uh, put them in storytelling and narrative and put bodies to them. And I think, you know, within the construct of that, you know, rem, you know, rom-com uh, story that was coming, I mean, you know, the history of lesbian cinema, doesn't you know? Doesn't have a deep deck, but uh, what what it does have is you, you have to have that looking. You have to have mm. that uh, identification. You have to have that character who um, you know sees somebody and and uh, we turn their, our attention to them, and it becomes you know what the narrative is about. So it's you know it's just a, I, I consider it a narrative trope, but um, I think there was you know fun making that scene happen because uh, one of my exes was actually um, the friend of Diana at the food <laughs> truck. So Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I always just add a little spice to everything. But I would oh. say the other thing that seems important here is this question of power and the power that Diana has um, in the scene leading up to that are all the scenes and the sex scene and the power that Cheryl has. Um, and, you know, 
Cheryl plays a character that's very naive. Diana plays a character, Gwen plays a character that's very world weary sort of. But, you know, in relation to the gays, it's Cheryl who's making the film and in the film. And Cheryl is making the real film. And so she's constantly got this, this thing over Diana, um, even though Diana's kind of um, claiming power in the wrong places in a lot of times, I think. And then yes. that's reflected. And then for me personally, right. And then for me personally, as Cheryl, the director, I think I was able to have and then living, you know, it's like checkers in my life as I made this film, because I was in a relationship with Alex, having, you know, this film commenting on some of the things that were going on in our relationship. And then we had our relationship in the present. So it was like my using the art, creating this piece of work to comment on things that we're not talking about or articulating or our power dynamics around race as a couple. Um, oh, wow. You know, yeah. and trying to advance things and, you know, so there was a lot of meta, meta, meta going on. Um, and, you know, my connect, you connect, disconnect, whatever. Um, you know, it was more about creating this to kind of fill that space. But, you know, there was a lot of like, again, playing checkers with, you know, me directing it, me being in scenes, Alex producing it. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it, and of course, remember, I'm also playing Martha Page. You know that, right, Tara? Which one's Martha? Oh gosh, she's the um, white woman. The, the white she's the white woman director. director. Oh, of course. Right. Uh, I just happen to have the book. Okay. Right so so that's you, actually, yeah, that's actually important because that story that's being played in the past mm, is played in the present and then also in reality yes. in the source as well. Yes. Were you and, all sort of aware of that at the time? I don't aware think of, you could see it. Area. it yeah. Oh, because you, yeah, you left face all yeah. ghostly. <laughs> and, and Martha Page is a tarot, is a bad guy in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, She's, um, you know, privileged, exploitative, you know. Just had, um, having a lot of fun, yeah. Yes. A COVID fun. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to have some sort of fun. Um, oh, God, it's 23 parts. So, um, yeah, let's get into the sex scene. So, um, as I was saying, like, you know, it's a gorgeous scene it has that heat, it still has that sensuality and stuff. It's really interesting now to know that your relationship was sort of interplaying with the actual plot and the themes of the film. And Lightly. Yeah. yeah. No, no, like no, no, not, yeah, not, yeah, not like completely, you know, it's not, oh, what's the word? All right, move this way, Alex. We, Alex and I had <laughs> been in a sex scene in, a, in another artist's film, Shuli Chang's film, um, and I think that was the first time that we, it was a, more of a what, art art video video art piece um what was it called fish or something sex uh, fish sex fish that fish. was called yeah sex fish um sex fish so i think maybe people who know shuli chang and her work um would see i don't know if there's any similarities <laughs> <laughs> um i'm just being asked um how many people want to know what book you were holding up gerald Oh, um, it's called the Faye Richards Photo Archive, and it's the book that was published by the photographer Zoe Leonard, who we collaborated on to create the um, uh, pictures that appear that I find in the film. So you can get this on Amazon and uh, other places. I think it's a uh, art space book. I would go to okay. art space and get yeah, it. Yeah, Zoe and Leonard. I, 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 Zoe, Zoe gets the money. I never received a penny from it, but I, it's an important document to have because I think it really is this archive and you can see all the pictures. And I'm actually in one photo, which you wouldn't even know. And my mom's in the pictures. Alex is in the pictures. But we had to create this because um, I, we, we, we couldn't afford to uh, buy an archive. So as a strategy, it just came to my mind and I was in an art environment already. I had just graduated from uh, Rutgers and I got my MFA there to work with another artist to create these pictures with my friends and make the pictures that I wanted anyway. So it, it became, uh, you know, there's like another layer of the film creating these photographs with ex several X's are in there, you know, desire running all through the place and Alex in the pictures as well. So. It's just, you know, it, making that film is a big, uh, yeah you know, coming to a lot of, you know, uh, terms with uh, 
sexuality desire that even on the screen and off for me in my life. I mean, it was a, a very pinnacle point about sort of even a coming out or coming to um, some concept of who I uh, uh, was or am, was I guess more than at that time as a sort of a black lesbian um, uh, and, and my, my issues with my own personal desire on and off the screen. But I will say that we also made the fake photographs with Zoe and a large cast and crew because when Cheryl went to look in the archive, which she was doing originally, it was very hard to find images of black lesbians. There was none. And so Cheryl created that with Zoe and the rest of us, the crew, to fill a story that sh they knew was true, but hadn't been documented, or if it had been documented, hadn't been saved. So like the archival resonance of the film has been, people like to talk about a lot. Um, but they did find a few photographs and they show up well, yeah, the few for yeah, the few that one on the beach, yeah. uh, the, the, on the beach. Okay, oh, that, that yeah, was so really, let, yeah. so that saying there has been interracial desire in Western culture in the past, and you know, for me to place it in Hollywood at that time, I mean, just to you know, illuminate on other artists who are you know uh, going down that path right now. There's a uh, on Netflix, there's a show called Hollywood that's a Ryan Murphy yeah. uh, limited series, which kind of is doing, you know, very similar things in a different way with um, interracial desire at this time. Um, so it's just who has, you know, who wants to make these stories and, 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 and tell them um, and, and, and using their agency or, or using their lack of agency or yeah. using their truths, you know, in the case with Alex, yeah. um to to tell them and using your instincts as well so i always feel yes. like mm -hmm. you kind of using know you instincts. already existed you can't you don't, you don't want to think you are original um you know there's always something that happened that maybe got written down in a certain way and is in someone's attic right now that we haven't discovered um like i loved looking at the sort of the blue singers around the turn of the century because so many of them were like black bisexual take no crap kind of people um, um which obviously fed into um Dee Reese's film Bessie um but yeah um I was thinking so with the sort of the love scene how do you do you when you were making it were you thinking this is for kind of gays again that word again that you were sort of looking for or were you just something were you just kind of making something that you were just able to respond to is that, is that so how first it works? Off, yeah. Sure. So first yeah. off, I want to, um, and I don't think she's on right now, but um, I'll, I'll tell her to look at this. I want to, um, you know, sh give a big shout out to Michelle Crenshaw, the cinematographer who shot it. Um, I've, I've worked with her again in the past and she helped um, with the 20th anniversary uh, re-release print and not why it looks better is because she really took the time, but, um, and, and trusting her instinct to deal with this because I was in the scene with something, you know, I let it, you know, I let it evolve that way. Um, we had several conversations. Um, Guinevere was a little bit more um, accepting. I mean, we had those kind of, you know, conversations between the three of us, kind of two of us. Um, uh, this is a point where there, you know, independent film was not as, you know, it was much more independent. So I think there was yeah. a bottle of, tequila in the room, um, there was no crew, it was just Michelle and I and, and Guinevere, um, everything was set up, so we had a closed set, and um, we just went for it and just really recorded it uh, with all our nerves and energy and um, uh, with a lot of references to uh, other films that I wanted to, you know, see those camera moves and things like that again, and ways not to be so explicit, because I think even at that point, time we were concerned about you know, how explicit this could be but how much to how much to how to cover it in a way that we can get the most out of it in the edit that would still be you know uh sexy and and still arouse and still stimulate so the shots of the hands um put in the right place falling in and out of frames i mean these become things that people um use today still in films. I mean, I discuss them 
every time we're doing a sex scene in a, a film on a, 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 an episodic level, I always try to get that hand shot because <laughs> it just it represents that you know thing and it's that so, cling you know, right yeah. you know, that clinging you know that. <laughs> so you know it, and and again um, you don't know that when you're doing it, especially when you are in the scene so there was a lot of nerves around that Guinevere was riding on her um, uh, riding high in her life at that point so she was becoming uh, uh, having done go fish and. She was quite the, you know, becoming a, a, a more uh, of a figure in the lesbian community. So she was sort of a mini star, starlet at that point. Um, and so there was also that, you know, I don't think I was, having worked in, with her on the show on Watermelon Woman for long enough, it was like, when just stop and let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Let's just get this done. We have so much more to do um, and we have no money. So there was, you know, all those factors went in, but um, it was, it, it was, it was a relief. I think Alex might have another story being on the other side of the door told to leave the room um, to let this happen. Maybe you want to say something, Alex, about it. I'd, I'd rather say something protestorial, which seems important, but which is that one of the things that we really, was really important in uh, the Watermelon Woman, but also the Owls was that we had black lesbians, black women, people of color, queers of color in as many key positions as we could. So that that was helping both in relationship to the gays itself. So Michelle Crenzo is a black lesbian, but also in relationship to a set of ideals we had about giving people you know, power and voice within the film industry. And Cheryl continues to do that in her other work as well. So I, I think it's important to understand that about what it meant for Michelle to have that position and for Michelle to be in the room with Cheryl talking about the sex scene. Um, in relationship to larger like ideas that we had about filmmaking and who gets to tell the story. Yeah. And I guess it's, it's that combination of um, like I said, the people and the ideas, especially when they intersect with yours and you're able to um, use that to create a space where you can make good work, but also work that you're happy with and you're comfortable with. Um, I think, you know, I always find it, important to sort of interrogate these methods just to make sure that you're creating something that is of the gaze and it is hot but also something that you that people can leave and be happy with it um, yeah so having a black lesbian shoot this yeah. scene definitely really reinforced what a black lesbian gaze was you know because I was only able to direct it from being in the scene uh, I just threw it in Michelle's hands and you know we we had many creative discussions as well as you know her being a black lesbian and my friend it was it was you know I was okay with it it was about the edit again so it's again having enough material to edit something and you know uh, also then putting the right music in that really makes that scene so to stand out skin when we found that so it's not just about what you see on the screen it's also what you hear the lighting the color the timing um our, our dp was a woman not a woman of uh, I mean, our uh, editor was a woman, not a woman of color, um, but she was foreign, <laughs> French. <laughs> that might have helped a little bit, um, but you know, definitely, uh, and and older um, than we were at the time. Um, so I think there was a, a maturity around re representation of images, where you know, uh, and, and kind of getting it right. Um, so we did take time editing this scene. Um, and yeah, you know, really explored the the possibilities and what we wanted to do with it. Um, and we definitely wanted to like go there and, and wanted this to show in the film. It's interesting when we sold the film to our Japanese uh, distributor, who no longer has really answered any calls or emails. I don't know why oh. over these many years. Um, so hopefully, if anybody is from Japan reaches out to him, get in touch. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Hey. Um, they actually aren't allowed, allowed to show, um, uh, what pubic is hair. it? Pubic hair. So they oh. had to kind of blur out some stuff. Tiny little thing that was, but you have to watch it carefully to see it. it Cause you <laughs> yeah. something if you but blur they, out, you just stare at it more. Like, <laughs> just, like, yeah, I think they, I mean, <laughs> So that's the only, you know, one place where I think there was a huge reaction around um, the sex scene. Although you could um, say that, I, but, the, and, but go ahead. The NEA defunding 
episode, which you may not have enough time for, is <laughs> no, also right. really yeah. about the yeah. sex scene. And yeah, it was so censored the NDA by, by the, the film. The National uh, Endowment for the Arts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went, went right. like, uh, yeah. Yep, Congress, um, you know, this went from the, 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 the floor of the House of Reps, right? With, could, do you want to tell the story really quick, Alex? No, you can. I just think it's important to understand 20 something years later that there really were so few images of lesbian sexuality and sex yeah. anywhere, and anywhere. It's still, I mean, up until last year, year before last, um, it suddenly became illegal in pornography to show things like queen sitting, like sitting on somebody's face if you're a woman sort of thing, um, or but, um, but, ejaculation if you were a woman. Um, right. And they only just sort of decided this white men are panel that maybe they shouldn't, but that took a lot of activism to get that to stop. Um, oh, I well, I'm, I'm really, I'm really yeah. excited. I, I, I want to keep going, but I, I, I must want to <laughs> round this out that I'm, yeah. I'm so happy that there are new uh, storytellers um, and, and, and people who are pushing that boundary. And I can tell you to continue to do so um, safely and, and collectively, because I think it's important to do things with others because you get it right. Um, and I, you know, definitely want you to, you know, enjoy your lives um, and live them to the fullest, you know, regardless of where we're going, because it's the beginning of the future for us. Um, and uh, it, you know, yeah, have and, sex, uh, have sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I was going to end, but I've now got a question apparently from the audience. Um, it says, as a lesbian woman, I'm always interested in debating our visual references. So I'd like to know what were the sex scenes, lesbian sex scenes that Cheryl had already seen by the time she made Woman Woman. So the first sex scene that I saw as a young, you know, so I came out, I was always out, I was never in. So I was looking for lesbian desire on the screen was something that I did as a, you know, in, in puberty. So um, in the mid eighties, early eighties, uh, Personal Best came out. Um, that Mario Hemingway was in it, and I forgot Patricia, I forgot her last name was in it, and that was the first sex scene I'd seen in a film, and they're interracial too. Um, and I, 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 I was like that. I, I, it's about uh, you know, women who are running and competing in, in long distance running, Olympia type of runners, and a relationship between these two women. Um, and uh, Everybody, if you're my age and you date it and you never see that film, the next thing you know, you're what you're doing is starting to run. <laughs> so you have to start <laughs> running around the track and then hoping to find another woman that's going to become an athlete. Fuck that, you know, whatever. So, um, Personal Best was one of the early films that I, I saw. I would also say Liana, though there was there was not enough. Uh, Desert Hearts, again, mm. there's not enough. What's um, Liana? How do you spell that one? L I A N. N A yes N -A -N -A. okay yeah mm. good and then I go mean, fi keep, go fish me. had yes yeah yeah mm. sorry go fish came out in the community like we were all making movies at the same time but go fish came first and that was amazing when it when we saw it uh, at the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival in New York City because that was like a first feature film um, that had been made by lesbians and. Um, it was like a revelation that that was possible, and then we come on the tail. Desert, Desert Hearts, Desert Hearts was a you know big one too to see that. That's so that that film sort of was the lead into uh, the the lesbian feature world at the so what we looks like at a modern day a lesbian gay uh, queer LGBTQ film festival. So the way that we look at those festivals now, the way they were kind of functioning at, at and. I think that was one of the first ones that sort of led the way to, you know, have enough people to come in for a screening and, and have a program, you know. But if you look at the Cheryl character's quest for history, the real Cheryl as a girl, since there weren't movie images, and Cheryl, you can speak for yourself, was looking for images wherever she could find them. So like whether that be novels or magazines or, you know, uh, youth groups because they, they were so few and far between. And so the, the searching of the Cheryl character in the movie is really connected to the searching of the Cheryl character, looking for lesbians, looking for black lesbians, looking for lesbian sexuality, where there's so few images anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I was thinking sort of before we wrap up, because um, as you can say, it's a trope now, unprecedented times. Um, 
what keeps you what what still quenches your desire what still how do you keep that desire within you to kind of make these films where we can see ourselves and have those lies and tell those truths like or just to help other people do that like what keeps you going because i feel like you've both been sort of having to navigate this sort of cis hetero cis white sort of um barriers and um prejudices prejudices and discrimination um and i always feel like when you get these films like what men and women like pariah like stud live it's, it's always like a accident an anomaly rather than how it should go so, and so i and i do wonder something like, yeah what what keeps you going alex no no that's for you sure <laughs> okay. Um, what keeps me going? I really don't know. I mean, I just, that's, I, you know, I was born this way. I was born to tell these, you know, I was born to tell um, not one story, but many stories. And, you know, I have, uh, you know, I'm in my early 50s now, 54 last week. Um, and birthday. I, thank you. COVID birthday. Uh, we have two of them in this house. Um, and I have more stories to tell before I, you know, it's over. And, mm. um, you know, you, you, I think you come with a set of stories <laughs> in you and you, you, you figure out how to tell them, you know, be it through the work that you do as an activist or even, you know, the work, any of your work, you know, you come with a set of stories. You, people are telling the same stories. People are storytellers. Um, within the world, and you, we, there's people who listen to them, and um, you, you, you want to have that engagement um, and that communication. So I have, I just am. You just have am. to. And yeah, you have to. And I just yeah. have to. There's nothing else I can do. I get you. I get you. Try to chip away at, at at what's inside of me, and and the ideas and the images and the way they lined up, and you know, yeah. and that imagination to see them actualized. Yeah. And as for as for producer. Yeah. And a friend and ex partner. I mean, she has a certain kind of courage and tenacity to like fight harder than some people may, even though we all have those stories, as well as talent and intelligence is a kind of big package. But really, just a fighting spirit to like not hear no and to know that her voice is important. All of our voices are, but Cheryl will fight for that. And it's great when people can support her. It was great to support her that people have. And if people aren't supporting her, she's doing it on her own. Yeah. Nothing compels you like the truth. Um, yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, um, please let us know um, how, if you, if you want to keep up with you, how can we keep up with whatever you're doing and such? Promote yourself. <laughs> I have a company called Jingle Town Films. Um, we have a website and a, a uh, social media presence so you can follow us on insta um there's also Cheryl Dunier on insta um and there's uh you know a website as well on facebook on all social media platforms um you can watch the shows that i have worked on episodic wise while you're locked in um i've done and just type my name in and you'll it'll come up on imdb but i've worked on queen sugar um uh i worked on claws which is a fun one oh, and it's, it's so interesting the shows i've worked on are very queer and of color uh, like i've been mm. honored to work on on dear white people you know mm. um with a, a a creator black queer showrunner um uh, and terrell mccraney's um david makes man um which is uh nominated for a peabody uh, this year um, was I was one of the there was a, only three directors or four directors on it and I was one of the directors who did some you know and, and Terrell right the, the words were beautiful so uh, uh, and creating these images were great and so it's great to again do things with others um, so you can even become better so I'm what I really actively am working on is how to become you know better awesome um, Alexandra please promote yourself um, well, I, my, most of my work is as a scholar and an activist, and my current work is about AIDS, has always been and continues to be about AIDS. I have a lot of work coming out right now that's thinking about the relationship between AIDS and COVID, working with an activist collect collective called What Women HIV Doula Do. And I also have a large body of work thinking about fake media, which came out of the Watermelon Woman. And so I have a pro project that I'm working on right now. I'm about to 
let loose a podcast about fake poetry that I've been writing with people around the world about fake news. And it's called We Need Gentle Truths for Now. And it, it premieres tomorrow. And um, you can follow me on my website and on Media Praxis Me on Twitter. Okay, great. And you're saying launches tomorrow. Where's that launch? Everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like we could have talked for thank a you. good hour thank or two. You. Like I can be going yeah. to it. So I'm so sorry I have to end. But um, thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I've had a great time. Um, well, you and everybody have been wonderful hosts, and you know it's always uh, you know amazing to have the opportunity to to speak to audiences about the work. Um, and I thank you guys for pulling this together. And uh, see you at the at the movies. See you at the movies. So um, if you enjoyed this event, please consider donating to the BFI. They are a charity, and their venues are closed during this lockdown. So your support helps them keep going during this period of closure. Furthermore, there are lots of BFI at home YouTube events happening all the time, including a feel female desire discussion around the film Bound next Thursday, which is, oh, um, you'd be sweet to miss it. So please subscribe to the channel and come back next week. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.